the marine commercials are spot on. Mm -hmm. You look at how perfect they are, and I'm sorry, but I don't think I've ever seen an ugly marine in dress blues. Yeah. I mean, I just don't know that it exists. <laughs> oh, no, it does. There's some busted ass dudes <laughs> Is wearing there? dress blues. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for joining us as we peek behind the curtain of a grunt's life where we dive deep into the psychology of our number one show with special guest Lauren Rich, a licensed clinical therapist who has been working with combat veterans for over a decade. Here, we'll discuss the ways in which the military mindset serves to win wars, but isn't as helpful for good mental health post-service. We'll also do a character analysis of Lieutenant Murphy, giving insight into his mindset and kind of psychotic behavior, kind of. So welcome to the Path Out of Hell, boys and girls. And we are back for the last episode of this mini-series, Behind the Curtain of a Grunt's Life, uh, where Lauren Rich is going to break it down and really let us know why we are as fucked up as we are, which is important for us to know why, right? We can't be walking around joking people out, not know why. So wake up, buddy. Have some self-awareness. Anyways. The whole point is that they're not fucked up. That's oh. the whole point of this. Oh, they're not? I still think you guys are fucked up. <laughs> Leadership. Leadership. You're fucked up, not me. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you guys are the problem. We're good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so we got episodes 10 and 11. 10 and 11, what yes. I love how we start with the never fail white sedan. Yes. That's a constant. I've had guys before who they think they're adults in there and they're children. Um, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And, and of course, they're always headed to the gate at high speeds and you're prepared, but you're never quite fully prepared. You know, the turp is always off somewhere. Somebody's always lacking mm. something. And so you have to make last minute decisions. Did you ever have that issue? Somebody charged the gate like that in a vehicle? No. No? We okay. did not. That's very common. That's so why we wrote it. Yeah, that is, um, that is a very common I had, I had heard about that happening uh, many times. And the white sedan, it worked out perfectly because mm -hmm. one of my homies, Alfredo, who is, uh, has been a part of almost every Vet TV crew mm -hmm. as a cameraman, uh, we used his car. Oh. <laughs> yeah, worked out great. Okay. The Mexican guy with the fucking busted ass beater, and we ended up breaking it. Had to spend $1,000 fixing it, but it's totally worth it. A worthwhile investment. Worth an investment. Yeah, absolutely. So then we have the CO who's already on site, and he hears over the radio that there's a civilian up there who needs medical attention. Yeah, SOG, this is six. We're going to need corpsmen and a fire team out there to assist the civilians. Quote, unquote, and immediately disbands the corpsmen and a squad to go check it out. Mm -hmm. No questions asked. We're going to go do yeah. what we can. And then he gets this fantasy of greatness. Mm -hmm. You know, we saved people. All is well, thanks to our brilliant leader. Fox 6, this is Reynolds. Uh, I've got three women and three children out here. Uh, we just saved two of the children's lives, and um, we're going to be able to, uh, to send the rest of them back to uh, Camp Bastion and uh, take care of their families for the rest of their lives. It's going to look really good for you in your career. This is his opportunity to take action and yes. do something that he knows the battalion commander is going to praise him for. Mm -hmm. And it's really ironic because, again, the hypocrisy. He says, the battalion commander has directed us to improve the relationship with the locals. Mm -hmm. And yet, he is part of destroying that relationship. Mm -hmm. But he expects you to do double time to make up for it. Yep. Mm -hmm. That gets frustrating. Absolutely. That's exhausting. When you're when you're fixing someone else's fuck-ups all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and, and every time Murphy has an interaction with him, it's not just justification, like we've talked about. It's education. But again, he thinks he knows it all, and so he's not even absorbing what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. You know where else people have seen this, exactly what you're talking about, absorbing somebody else's fuck-ups was Generation mm -hmm. Kill. Oh, One yes. of the sergeants was constantly trying to protect and stick up for and cover up the mistakes of Captain America, mm -hmm. his platoon commander. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, you watch that guy in Gen Kill get more and more frustrated until at the end he was just like... I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. This is fucking ridiculous. And then at the end, he's the one who got in trouble. Mm -hmm. And that really makes you hate the Marine Corps. When Absolutely. That shit Absolutely. That's, that, he, he'll live with that anger potentially his whole life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one reason why some veterans don't want to hang out with other veterans, mm -hmm. is because they're really pissed off at the, the Corps or the mm -hmm. Army or whoever. 
whoever um, represents that time in life, whether it's leadership, the government, you know, that branch in particular. Um, and so they don't really want to hang out with other veterans. They're okay with being by themselves. Because hmm. to be honest, I think a lot of people do that because it's too much of a reminder of bad things that happened that were out of their control. So sure. they don't, they don't intentionally, they don't hang out with other people. Yeah, they have, they, they have a negative association mm-hmm. with the military. Mm-hmm. And so they don't want to be reminded of the military. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, that's actually part of our mission statement, to recreate parity and celebrate the military experience for those who've served, is that, you know, knowing that there are many people who, like, they don't want to think about the military mm-hmm. anymore, and even not though they have these issues. Not everybody has a good service time. No. Yeah. A lot of people, they, they, they have a chip on their shoulder for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. I'm One of my buddies, he was just like, fuck the Marine Corps, fuck the DOD, mm-hmm. fuck Uncle Sam. I'm going to milk them for all it's worth. Mm-hmm. Fuck them. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's important that if we're going to get our audience and our community to relive these military experiences, mm-hmm. we need to put a new positive association with the military experience. And that's both the nonprofit, it's like, it's like when you show up to one of these events mm-hmm. with, with all of these military people, it's going to be a positive, happy, uplifting experience. Mm-hmm. When you watch an episode of that TV, you're going to watch some of the dark shit and some of the shit that pisses you off, but then we're gonna reframe it so that it makes you laugh and feel good because we'll give you your fantasy. Mm-hmm. will give you something to celebrate. And you know, I will say, combat veterans especially have a PR problem, but it's not necessarily because of combat veterans, it's because of the government, the government health care, mm. how we talk about them. The assumption is that all combat veterans are fucked up, that all of them have PTSD. And logistically, let's just talk about what constitutes a combat veteran. You can be in a combat zone, Kuwait, Bahrain, however we want to classify that, and on paper you get to check that box, but you've never actually engaged with the enemy. Of those that deploy, I'm sorry, of the total veteran population, only 11% end up being qualified as combat, and that's engagement with Hmm. the enemy, okay? Of that 11%, only 9 to 11% come back with diagnosable PTSD. Oh, wow. And those are government numbers, okay? That's not to say that people aren't seeking help, Um, that people maybe are over-reporting symptoms for secondary gain of financial compensation. Mm -hmm. Um, It's it's hard to say that those numbers are completely accurate because of who collects the data. So keeping that in mind and, and, you know, that we'll get we'll get to Carl a little bit here in a second once he runs out there. Murphy is trying to argue the logical side of let's not go there, just wait. I just gave an order to provide aid immediately to civilians, Lieutenant. Yeah. And we'll provide aid to the civilians when we know they're civilians. Not yet. Let's go make sure it's safe. That way no one gets hurt. And again, the altar of careerism. This guy is willing to sacrifice anybody for his next panel, basically his fit rep. Stop what you're doing, Lieutenant. I prefer not to be contradicted in front of my Marines. And I prefer my Marines don't get fucking killed, Six. Look, you don't know this AO like I do. Okay, so just listen to me, please, just this once. Staff Sergeant, get your Marines to do what the CO says right goddamn now. First Sergeant, I will not have my Marines run into an ambush. You two are really special, you know that? You think you know bets, don't you? When the CO gives the order, Murphy finds out, wait, what the fuck is going on? Hey, sir, th- let's not do this. Just hold on one second. Just slow down a second here. Mm-hmm. Right? It's a perfectly reasonable thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's when someone's ego has been compromised, when their decision making is in question, Mm -hmm. they get so hot that it becomes not about what is the best thing to do right now in this situation. It's not about what's best for the men. No. Mm -hmm. It's about, I am in charge. I said do this, so shut the fuck up and do this. Mm -hmm. And that creates immense frustration. Mm-hmm. in those who are um, beneath that, who feel the pain of that. And again, Murphy's not saying no, he's just saying not right now, but the CO takes that as challenge. And the message that's sent is, you're telling me I don't know how to do my job? Mm-hmm. You're telling me I'm incompetent? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so then he looks at the first sergeant and says, First sergeant, you need to get in control of the Marines. Right fucking now. 
go make those Marines do what I say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that I, th- I think that's a that's a pretty relatable thing mm-hmm. in terms of of a leader um, not taking good advice because the ego has become more important. Mm-hmm. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so next thing that you're So mentioning. then we get up to Carl, who is just constantly trying to please and be accepted by someone. And so who is the CEO going to get to listen to him? Sir? Sir? What's going on? He gets Carl. Yep. Both of them are, are mirror images of one another. And they want to be accepted. They want to be wanted. They want to be important. And so they do. They, they meet that emotional need for one another. Yeah. Then we end up with Carl dashing out there before it's cleared and takes some car to the face. <laughs> you know, he, he finally kind of gets what they've been talking about all along the entire, the entire season. He gets um, what well, they wanted him to get. They wanted yes, him to get hurt. Yes, because earlier it's do we want his legs to get blown off or do we want him to just die? Mm-hmm. We don't want him to be a war hero. I don't want to see him at the VFW in a year, you know, having people buy him beers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, so that, that, I mean, I find that, I find that pretty comical because that's exactly what happens. But, mm-hmm. you know, Carl, unfortunately, is now going to get to wear the Purple Heart because of his own stupidity. But the public will never know that. He'll never share that with anybody. It will just be a secret in the experience with his unit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and Carl is the kind of guy who um, is part of the PR problem for veterans in that he's arrogant. He thinks that the military wouldn't function without him. When you see those guys who wear the dysfunction as a badge of honor, you know, medicated veteran, disabled veteran, dysfunctional veteran, you know, the, the shirts that have the weapons on them, it's, and it says the, uh, the gun is the tool, I am the weapon, or something like that. You know, all that does is perpetuate to the public that we're broken and dysfunctional. Yeah. And that really is the worst thing that you can do for PR, mm-hmm. you know. Dysfunctional veterans. Yes, those that that very small sect of the population. It's I don't think it's very large to to be honest, but that very small sect of the population that wears the badge of dysfunctional honor to get attention, to get praise because they don't feel good enough is part of the BR, PR problem. It's it's similar to all of those people who present with stolen valor. Hmm. You know. And I'm sorry, but I live in rural Oklahoma, and I can't tell you how many men I've had come in who um you know, I went through buds, I went through this, I went through that, or how many people make those comments. And just statistically, that's quite impossible considering how many people have gone through spec, op, spec ops training, how many people have um, fallen out, the number of veterans in America, and then the population of rural Oklahoma. That math, it just does not add up. <laughs> like, Absolutely does not add up. I think you're full of shit, buddy. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's just one of those things that you have to roll is, with. And you're like, you aren't spec ops. Come yes. On. Yes. Yeah, you just have to roll with that sometimes. But, you know, humility is is key. It really needs to be key in the veteran mm-hmm. community for the PR problem to get any better. Yeah. Okay, you know what? I'm going to talk on that, on, on the humility thing, because mm-hmm. you develop such uh, an attachment to your own ego when you are in these alpha male-dominated environments, because mm-hmm. there's also, you know, if you're in for just some short period of time, you become a leader, mm-hmm. you know, two, three years in, team, team leader. And um, and there is this perception of what a leader should look like and what a leader should be like and act like and what everyone should think of the leader. And maintaining this alpha male persona, being dominant in, in a military way mm-hmm. is important, which military dominance means you not only need to be um, smart, you technically and tactically proficient, um, but being unhesitant to engage in confrontation, mm-hmm. to get in someone's face mm-hmm. and be aggressive well, in front. That's important stuff. So many of them leave and they feel like they're owed something, you know, and that goes back to the entitlement and, and the PR problem. And it, it's beyond, you've talked a little bit about, you know, hiring veterans and not giving them anything beyond, you know, the interview or the, the extra points or even the job. Beyond that, they need to prove themselves, Yeah, you know. Um, and that kind of goes back to you served voluntarily. You know, you voluntarily went over. However, just to say that we do something with eyes wide open does not mean that we see what's coming. Mm. 
Okay, and I don't know that our enlistment numbers would be as high as they are if people knew the aftermath of deployment. If they knew the, the post-trauma life, the divorce, the alcoholism, the nightmares, the struggle with jobs, the struggles with parenting, the struggles with education and reintegrating, if we talked about that more, I'm sure the numbers would go down significantly. Sure. But we hype up um, the war hero, um, whether or not the guy loses his legs, you know, those kinds of things. I mean, the Marine commercials are spot on. Mm. You look at how perfect they are, and I'm sorry, but I don't think I've ever seen an ugly Marine in dress blues. Yeah. I mean, I just don't know that it exists. <laughs> oh, no, it does. There's some busted-ass dudes <laughs> Is wearing there? dress blues. Okay. Yeah. So, well, you're in just the too looking at the uniform. You don't yes, notice you're how distracted. fucked up his face and okay. teeth are. Okay. So in, in thinking about that, what they present <laughs> and how they recruit is not necessarily reality. The, the real kicker, I think, on that piece when we're talking about the integration back into society and all of those things, things and what society really thinks of the military, there's one particular commercial out there for the Marine Corps, and it has this female, and she is um, in the dark, and then I think she's belly crawling through the mud or something like that. And I, I'm pretty sure the end says, every Marine a rifleman. But the problem is, is that they portray her as if she's an infantryman in combat. Because I'm pretty sure they show bullets whizzing past her or the chaos of the convoy or something like that. So the perception is that she's a woman who can deploy in that sense. But the tagline is, every Marine a rifleman. And the public doesn't know the difference between infantrymen and, and riflemen. Mm. And so we sell this concept of being a war hero, but the aftermath is really what people struggle with. Yeah. If, it, if it were just so easy to be a war hero, everybody would serve. Yeah. The, the glory. Marine recruiting uh, commercials for recruiting women, they don't show mm -hmm. that, that that poor girl was sexually assaulted three times before she ever went to war. No, no. They, they don't, don't show, show that any shit. of that. No, nope, none of it. And, um, you know, it's it's just their way. Yeah. You know, they sell the very best of their product. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and here's the thing. I, I get it. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, the military must maintain mm -hmm. some quota to defend the nation. Mm -hmm. So I, I totally understand that. Um, however, there has to be a balance between being... Um, somewhat transparent and upfront about the expectations upon entering, right? So, so here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Recruiting has to stay the way it is. They have to keep throwing these perfect facades up on yes. the screens, right? Yes. Mission first. Okay, right? Mission first. Because <laughs> we got to get them in the door. Then mm -hmm. you get them in, the, in, in through MEPS. I think, I think boot camp because these kids are so fucking pussy nowadays. They're, they're trying to skate out of boot camp uh, way earlier than they used to, apparently, from... From what I'm hearing, my, my wow. friends who are uh, in the system now, mm -hmm. they're like, it's it's scary how many kids are bitching out of boot camp wow. and even SOI and at rates higher than history. Why go? Uh, well, because they've been playing video games and they mm -hmm. think it looks cool. Yeah. The commercials a look very, cool. A very large misconception of what war's like. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, their, the extent of their, their life has been social engagements. I mean, what percentage of their, of their communication mm -hmm has been on text message mm -hmm. since they were 10. You know what I mean? Yeah. So a, a decade, what percentage of their communication with other human beings has been through text? Mm -hmm. So they have High no enough, concept of... They don't. They, they can't even read tone, body language, fucking eye movement, they can't read any of that shit. And then they get into boot camp and ah, they don't know how to deal with all this shit. And I tap, I'm, I tap, 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 tap. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna kill myself. And then they're fucking out. Mm -hmm. And it's like... Quickest, it's, quickest way out of boot camp? Should I even say that? Is to graduate on time? <laughs> Bedwetting. Oh, really? Oh, you'll get separated like that. Oh, wow. Well. Bedwetting and sleepwalking. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sleepwalking, too. Uh -huh. But bedwetting. I love to do a parody of yeah. a couple kids you trying could, to figure out how to get that. out. <laughs> yeah, you could. You could do that. It happens. It happens. It's a quick route out. So, anyways, my, 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 my point there was mm -hmm. that you can't tell them what it's really like at the beginning of boot camp. I think you tell them mm -hmm. after, <laughs> Aiden, after you get to EGA, Right? They have the EGA ceremony before you're about to go see your parents. Then you give them this mental health briefing. It mm -hmm. says, hey, guys, look at what could potentially happen to you. Look at the things that you're going to experience. Look at the mindset that you're going to develop while you are here in the military because it's we've got to make warriors and killers out of you. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're going to be doing to you psychologically. Um, don't forget that on your way out the door, we're going to readdress this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, as a part of TRS, Transitional Readiness Services, you, they need to have s 
at least an entire day where it's all mental health. So this is how we brainwashed you in boot camp. And yes, guys, that is exactly what we did. We brainwashed you because that's how you set up a, a, an army and prepare them for war. And this is what we did here. This is what we did in this part of your training. This is all of the infidelity and the lying and shit that you experience within the military. That is not normal life. It is not normal to have as much cheating and infidelity around you as it is in the military. So that leads to the question of, if the military made me this way, are they also responsible for undoing that work? I think at the very least, mm -hmm. they should have that in TRS. I think it's un unrealistic to expect more of them, mm -hmm. but I think that in TRS, they need to address all of the things mm -hmm. that they brought up at the very end of boot camp, address the things, and then direct them to hundreds of resources. Mm -hmm. And those resources, it doesn't have to be by the government, but there's, I mean, 40,000 uh, military nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. So it's like- That's crazy. Direct them- 40,000? Yeah, have, I mean, anyone can register for LLC. For a nonprofit, yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so anyways, I think that is what's needed um, at the very least, mm -hmm. to improve the mental health for the long haul. I would but the, say, but the but the marketing and recruiting has got to stay the facade that yes, it is. Yes, yeah, and I totally get that. I don't I don't know that there's fault in that, but it doesn't um, unless you've kind of lived military life or culture, you don't really know the difference between the advertisement and reality. Yeah, yeah. So as far as the military undoing that work, um, that's a labor intensive job, yeah. and for a lot of you, that really is a lifetime. And and so people say. They come in and they say, well, I've been out 15 years. I shouldn't have problems like this anymore. Says who? Yeah. You know. And so I always ask them, how long should the transition process take? And they'll say, well, I served for five, so maybe 20 years. Some say three. That's yeah. how quickly they should be integrated back into society, so to speak. This is a lifetime, a lifelong process. There is nothing wrong with having that slow change year after year you know, feeling like you fit in more and more, making more strides and more work, but you didn't get this way overnight, this will not be undone overnight. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So you have to be really patient with yourself because, again, this is not a um, flip the switch issue. Mm -hmm. This is a you have to work at it issue. Totally. Yeah. It's just like my knee hurt for mm -hmm. six fucking years because I ripped this tendon right here. Mm -hmm. Big rip. Okay. Six years. Now, in six years, how much time did I actually put to rehabbing it. Mm -hmm. I, I put in, you know, a couple minutes during every one of my hour and a half long gym sessions, mm -hmm. put a couple minutes towards it, and then after a while, nothing happened. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm just gonna live with it. And I lived with the pain for mm -hmm. six years. And then finally, I told a friend of mine who was a physical therapist for the Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. I told her about the pain and she was like, oh no, you don't have to keep living with that. You can fix that shit. I said, how? She said, dry needling. Mm -hmm. So she takes these little acupuncture needles and she jams it into the muscle. Man, doing this shit. Just re-ripping up these, these fibers a little bit. Mm -hmm. She does that and then she puts this uh, electricity thing on there. Stimulating. Zzz, mm -hmm. The stem stuff. Zzz, mm -hmm. And then gave me some re rehabilitative exercises. So I started doing that like at t taking another approach to repairing the problem, mm -hmm. the injury, and it started feeling better. I'm like, oh wow. So then, hold on, let me, let me, let me spit it out. So then I, uh, I, I say, okay, I wanna go next level. I bought the things myself. I did a bunch of research and I'm doing dry needling on myself. Mm -hmm. I just stick the needles in there and then I bought a little massage therapy gun and bah, 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 every single morning when I wake up, da, 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 I'm very, very disciplined about it. every single morning. That is how I start my day da, 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 on, on both these knees, but especially that. Sure enough, the pain is gone. Mm -hmm. I thought I would live with it forever or until I had surgery or something magic happened. I, I believed, someone helped me believe that it is possible to fix it and once I believed, I took the actions and I did. No, what happened was you were tired of the pain. You were finally to the point where you were ready for change. Well, no, I had, got, I had given up. You got, well, clearly not. You she got made tired. me believe. You got tired of living that way. Otherwise, you wouldn't have even asked her. Yeah, I guess that, I well, mean, she, she, no, she saw me in pain. She okay. was just like, what is it? And then she told me. Mm -hmm. And then once she said, I can fix that, mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, really? My so that mind goes went, back to, whoa! That goes back to you didn't know what you didn't know, yeah. right? Okay, the mind is the same way, except people suffer for 20 yeah. years with the intense distress that they're dealing with when all they would have to do is, quote, unquote, go to physical therapy for the mind, yes. go through rehab, practice what we talk about, and life gets better. Yes, that, that's where I was going with that. You have to it? be ready for that change. 
You know, you have to be ready to make that phone call. Sure. I, I, you I, got lucky. She saw you in pain. Correct. Yeah. But okay, but but that's something that I I, I haven't heard talked about enough because I've mm -hmm. heard you have to be ready many, many times. Mm -hmm. But I haven't heard people say that you have to believe that it is possible to fix your issues. I think a lot of people think that, oh, this is just how it's going to be. So actually research, there's actually been research on this. So I need veterans to not believe that this is going to be a cure-all, and I need them not to believe that nothing will ever change. No, no, I need I, them to be... Just they need to believe that it's possible to yes. fix the issue. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. They need to be in the middle of the road. I'm not saying that therapy will fix everything because it won't, but it fix it fixes a lot of things. But if you believe that it's you're going to come in and it's going to be a cure all, then it will you will you will be disappointed when we only get 75% of progress. If you believe that it will fix absolutely nothing and you have no faith at all, you will see no progress. Totally. And so I need you to be somewhere in the middle of the road. Mm. You know, be open-minded enough to give it a chance. Okay. Yeah. Love that. Let's go ahead and move on to where the CEO gets shot okay. and and um, he approaches Murphy you know again more more issues for acceptance yeah we're taking contact from all sides and we are engaged no copy six we're already tracking a large engagement go out there and he's picking up the radio and he's calling in fire and they say yeah six we're already <laughs> we're aware of the engagement yeah. we know exactly what's going on right yeah but more I'm important I need to be wanted yeah. I need to be important I need people to know that I'm in charge. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, oh, I guess everyone knows I'm not in charge. Mm -hmm. What's ETN on that fire mission? Okay, my box, you got two of them. Oh. oh. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Yeah. That's I was really asshole. disappointed when that character gets killed. I, I, because I liked, the, I liked the fighting in regards to the show. I was disappointed when you killed him off. Uh, don't worry, we got plenty of officers <laughs> to kill. We got. <laughs> we gonna be making this show. This is a this is a franchise for the company. Yeah. For the network. This so. Is true. Um, this is true. So in in thinking about that process, here Murphy is yet again. You know, not. And I I use this term specifically for a very specific reason because when we see him interact with the Afghan man who comes to report the IED maker, he shakes his hand. He's very cordial about it. He's mm -hmm. very much a gentleman yes. in that in that presentation. And here he is yet again being very much a gentleman. Mm -hmm. You know, this cocksucker of a CEO has done nothing but fuck him over time and time again. And when he gets shot, what does he do? He straps him to the uh, Hesco barrier mm -hmm. and saves his reputation. Mm -hmm. Four six. I'll put you in for now. Fox one, are you tracking hacksaws at the I really got a kick out of the fact that he looked at him and said, "We'll put you in for a nam." Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So yes, I, I mean that part was really great. The CEO gets what's coming again in the storyline, but like I said, Murphy is a real gentleman, and he again does what is right for everybody. Yeah. Now it's funny you say that because when I when I wrote it, I was like, there was. And there was no intent to protect the CEO's reputation. It was just, that was the easiest way to make sure he dies. Mm. That was why he did that. No matter what, the CEO getting shot, right? So let's say the dude got shot, mm -hmm. he fell backwards, and then Murphy would then have to call in a med back, hey guys, the CEO's shot, fucking take care of him, to patch up a sucking chest wound or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what Murphy should have done, according to, you know, mm -hmm. what's technically right although i think what he did was right because by doing that he, sa right. he saved lives yeah right sometimes one person right. needs to die from other for a, a hundred mm -hmm. to live mm -hmm. so that's the thought process here in this moment murphy's just looking around he's like wow this is my chance this to make this guy go away mm -hmm. without me getting in trouble mm -hmm. right because he 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 really wanted to kill him and in the writing of the show um uh, myself and the other writers we came up with a whole bunch of different ways to kill him. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Murphy looked around and then blasted him in the face. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, ah, oh. we, we hung on that for a long time. And it just didn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. And then eventually came up with the idea of, the, of clipping him to the thing. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like for the audience, it's like, oh, that's so believable. Like actually blasting the guy in the face and that, that that's just, that's just like, oh, that's a total fantasy. Mm -hmm. But I think this was more rewarding to the audience because what Murphy did, it's like, oh my God, that's so brilliant. That's so, po that's so possible. It's like, oh my God, there's hope. I could be creative and frag my officer too. <laughs> well, and 
<laughs> and, you know, in thinking about that, the CO gets what he wants, too. I mean, this is almost a win-win. I hate to be that way, but it really is a win-win because the CO gets the glory of dying in combat, which uh, sure. will earn respect of others. And Murphy has been the one to give him that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there would have been more glory for the CO if he lived. Now he's got a purple heart. He's good to wear his purple heart. He's got in his a chest. nam. He got a nam. Purple heart with yeah. a nam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, so anyway, so that was you know kind of the logic behind there. And then, and then what I was hoping for is that once the CO dies, then all of a sudden the energy on the base returns to joyfulness and mm-hmm. happiness. Morale goes up. Morale goes up, and they don't even know he's dead. Mm-hmm. But just magically, America! with his death, yes. I just nailed a dude in the midsection, and I'm like happy. Hit. No, thank goodness. You hit lucky number six. Oh fuck that man! I fucking nailed six to ten, motherfucker! Oh yeah, get some. Mm-hmm. There's joy going on everywhere. The machine gunners fucking passing the gun around, and. It was just like life is automatically better with life is better. Yeah. Part of this all comes from my belief from being a young kid being bullied. All of my fantasies emanated from the period of my life when I was bullied. Mm-hmm. And where fantasy was more enjoyable than reality. Because I would my reality sucked. I was mm-hmm. trying to fit in and I was constantly being shitted on. And I kept kind of force trying to force myself to fit in with this group that didn't want me. Mm-hmm. And through that experience I, I came to enjoy my fantasies more than I enjoyed my reality. Mm-hmm. So I lived in my own world, and when some guy would, would make me feel like shit on any given day, I would have this fantasy. I remember this one guy I'd fantasize about sticking drugs in his backpack. Mm-hmm. Like I'd concoct up. a plan and then call, and like m- giving an anonymous tip and then setting him up to get busted and shit. Mm-hmm. And just thinking of that, I was just like, oh, it just made me feel good. And then it made me forget feeling like shit, and then I would forget the whole thing and move on and, and not actually take action on that. That experience then led me to just have this massive desire to beat up bullies. Mm-hmm. And so then that led me through another decade of my life when I fought a lot. And anytime I came across someone who I thought was an asshole, I felt like it was my responsibility mm-hmm. as a superhero in my own mind to beat the living fuck out of bullies mm-hmm. as a means of making the world a better place. And so I, this is psychotically, I lived with the belief. Well, that that's if justification. I, if I beat up bullies, mm-hmm. I am making the world a better place. I did, yes, I did a greater good. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's kind of like, what's the HBO show where the, the chemist goes and kills people? Breaking uh, Bad? No. Starts with a D. No, oh, Dexter. Dexter. He's oh, yeah, going yeah. and he's killing bad guys. Yes. It's justifiable because I'm, I'm making the world a better Seeking place. Seeking out the trash. Yes, yes, exactly. The military is home for many people who have never felt wanted, loved, or accepted. Oh, yeah. It is family. It is brotherhood to the extent. And even if you don't like the guy that you serve next to, you would still take a bullet for him. Yeah. So, so that feeling of now the bully's gone, the bad mm-hmm. guy's gone, it's like, ah, oh, <sighs> the world's yeah. a better place. Yeah, looks brighter. And that's where that, the energy and the whole joyfulness and cel- celebratory nature mm-hmm. uh, kicks in at the end there. Anyway, so yeah, season two, we have plenty of things going on. We'll get, to, mm-hmm. we'll get a lot more action. Um, we're going to get to engage with the enemy more. We're going to spend more money on this thing. Um, have a couple different bases, uh, more officer characters. But then our antagonist is going. Our main antagonist is going to be a um, a local drug lord, who the battalion commander loves the guy because he keeps feeding them HVTs that that, that make him look good. So everything comes down to the battalion commander is looking good mm-hmm. because of the HVTs that this local drug lord is giving him. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that this this local drug lord is at, he's playing both sides. Mm-hmm. He's As many of them to the do. Taliban. They all do. Yeah. Um, and, and anyone who is old, who survived the Russian time, mm-hmm. it's because they're really good at being full of shit. Mm-hmm. They're really good at playing both sides. Mm-hmm. If you've survived both the Russians and the Americans, do not trust that guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because he's going to tell you that, whatever you want to hear. Yes. So anyways, uh, so there it is. That was 11 episodes mm-hmm. of a Grunt's Life. You, you came in here and you broke down all of these characters and you enabled us to look deeper into the things that each character is thinking and feeling. I don't think many people who actually lived it, mm-hmm. I don't think they saw other people with that level of depth. They didn't look at their buddy who was always doing this thing and acting this way. They didn't look at him and think about what he's thinking right now, and what he's feeling right now, what pain he's been through in the past and what he grew up with. No one thought about that shit. Mm-hmm. But you dissecting this, I'd, I'd bet money that the guys who watch this are gonna be like, 
oh my God, that makes total sense. I remember my buddy was just like that and mm -hmm. he did have this problem and he was going through this. And mm -hmm. after, years later, he did tell me about all the shit that was going on in his head and in his heart. And I, I hope it was helpful. Know that it is not normal to think about your own thought process. The, the fancy pants word for that is metacognition. And all that means is thinking about your own thoughts. Normal, regular, everyday people don't do that. Really? You do, you, yeah, you mm. don't do that. I do that I do. because, well, not in this way you don't. I do that because it's my job. And so it's on a continuous basis that I meet with people, and this is exactly what we're doing. Huh. Okay? But it is not normal. You're I right. I do that with myself. Do you? All the time. You think about the way you think? Yeah. I'm alone a lot, and I live in my head a lot. You can, that's, gosh. Nice place to visit. Wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> oh, it's great. <laughs> Is it's a blast. It? I'm a little kid. Okay. So the, the entire point of therapy is that people get lost in their own mind. Okay? Yeah. The distorted labyrinth, so to speak. And all I am is your battle buddy to get out of there. Oh. Okay. So if you think about this as a way to get out of your own mind, right? A mm. way to figure out your own path. That's really what we wanted out of the character analysis was for people to understand why they're thinking the thoughts that they have. Okay. So hopefully it was beneficial. We'll see what the feedback says. <laughs> I, I, I have high hopes. So this has been absolutely incredible. The famous Lauren Rich was here to um, provide us incredible insight. And we are so incredibly grateful that you did. And I hope to continue this thing with you. Sure. Um, yeah. And continue talking with you. And, and uh, we've got the Mental Health, Mental Hell and Wellness mm -hmm. uh, podcast that is going to continue. And we're always going to want um, uh, anyone with experience as a mental health professional like with yourself, veterans with veterans have standards yes yes, uh, yes of course mm -hmm. and um, and we are going to want to speak to you and continue learning and continuing the conversation sure because um, Jack Mandeville's character oh yeah man so man, many oh, characters man. so many things <laughs> to talk about um, yeah this has been amazing Lauren Rich yes you pleasure are incredible. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much. Appreciate, appreciate the invitation you. and yeah we'll have you back sometime soon and to all of you, um, make sure you are being aware of when you need help and make sure that you ask for it. Because you're never going to engage in a fight and not ask for help. You're never going to get pinned down in combat and then just like act like you and your buddy got it. The first thing that you do when you're pinned down, when you are suppressed, is get on the radio. You call for mortars. You call for machine guns. You call for close air support. You call for art artillery. That's the first thing. It's second nature. So it should become second nature with your own mental health. You do it with bodily injuries. Why don't you do it with mental injuries? There's a stigma. We got to get over that shit and just acknowledge that mm -hmm. our mental injuries are far more damaging than any physical injuries that the we have. The strongest men I know are the ones who walk in my office. Yeah. Yeah, they really are. Strength comes in many different ways, my friends, many ways. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again. And thank you for watching and listening. Peace, love, and war.